Okay, let's let's uh, let's get started going through the sources. I'm very excited about some of the things we have to uh, to see this time. So hope it's a fun ride for everyone. The first source is from one of my favorite books at the moment. This book, The Mo'o and I Am, from the Shinobla Rebbe. Um, he writes so beautifully and so clearly and brings us a lot of the most radical ideas from the early Hasidic masters, the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid that he learned with. Um, found it to be very illuminating, as the, as the name of the book suggests. Becky, welcome, if that's you joining us. I can't see you yet, but hope you're... Hi, yeah, that's me. Oh, wonderful. Okay, welcome. Um, we, we just started. We ju I'm just introducing the first source on the sheet, the memo and I am. Um, please uh, mute your microphone, apart from when you have something to say. And generally, I can say for everyone, it's better if people um, like ask questions on the chat, which uh, I'll open now so I can see if anyone uh, jumps in with a comment or question at any point. Okay, so the Maori and I am. Um, he gives us here a, a very clear elucidation of a principle that we find throughout the mystical tradition in a lot of different ways. Uh, but he just spells it out really nice and in a way that we can apply it to, to anything and everything at any point. So I actually read the Hebrew because it's so beautiful and clear. Kol ha mitzvot shenitzvanu b'avo eit v'zman shel kol mitzvah b'mitzvah n'toreh ha-dvah shahaya b'eit zman ha-mitzvah k'mei az m'kedem. When the appointed time comes for each mitzvah, meaning commandment or connection, the original primal cause of the mitzvah is awakened. So I think you guys uh, you know, probably uh, get where I'm going with this, but you know, since we're, we're here to talk about Purim mostly, when Purim comes around, according to this principle, it's not just, oh, it's the time of year where once upon a time there was a single Purim. It's not like that. It's now is an awakening of the energy of what happened then. It happens every year, a similar opportunity for awakening. So um, the next source is um, the prob probably the main source that he's drawing on his statement. And it's, it's uh, a good deal less uh, simple, but it gets us into interesting territory in seeing what the Kabbalistic masters thought the energy, energy of this month was and the energy of Purim was. So this is Rav Chaim Vital, who has other right on the sheet. Is the main student of the Arizal of Rav Isaac Luria. He's the main channel that we get Lurianic Kabbalah through. So he says to us, the blessed divine wants to benefit us and to illumine for us the corresponding illumination of each time, of each special time in the year. Each year on these days of Purim, when the original miracle happened, there is always a revelation of the illumination of Mordechai in these days. So that's, that's his name for, the, for this energy of this month and this time, the illumination of, Mordech, of Mordechai. Ha'ara shel Mordechai. So he, he, um, he, in the piece he, that I quoted that short snippet from, he uh, does explain at length what that means to him in his worldview. Welcome, Shia. And... Um, he, uh, in, in the Lurianic model that he provides us with, basically that there's a, uh, there's a process of God being divided from God's self and then God coming back together through loving union. God, God essentially being divided from God's self and then God making love to God's self. And the illumination of Mordechai is one stage in that whole process of the universe being broken and then being brought back together and being fixed. So that is wonderful and not something I can necessarily say that I can apply directly in my everyday life. So fortunately, we have many, many generations of masters and wonderful teachers to bring these teachings a little bit more into our direct sphere of relevance of what we do every day. So the, um, the Breslov Hasidic tradition Rabbi Nachman, of, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and his students really do that with a very special psychological sensitivity. And that's probably the main reason that Breslov Hasidut 
the, their teachings has become very widespread and influential across the Jewish world because um, it's, it's very insightful for modern psychology. A lot, a lot of people find it, it resonates a lot with what we're going through. So this is a pretty typical classic example of that from Rabbi Nachman's main student, Reb Nosson or Rabbi Reb Nathan. And uh, it's from a, a very wonderful work called Likute Halachot that um, applies the teachings of Rabbi Nachman to the Shulchan Aruch, the main code of Jewish law. So you're, you read the, the code of Jewish law, but then you see the gloss of, uh, of Rabbi Nachman's teachings brought by Rabbi Nosson. So he tells us here, what is the illumination of Mordechai? What does that mean? That it comes back every year at this time? What does that do for us in our everyday lives? He says, in every generation and every year, this illumination of the aspect of Mordechai shines for us so that every year we have strength to leave behind every descent in the universe and to invert every descent in the, into the essence of ascent. So this is a principle we find throughout the Hasidic teachings from the Baal Shem Tov onwards, from the founder, that descending, going down, is, is actually a good thing because descending always precedes ascending. There's no way you can grow in any way without there being some lack or deficiency or descent first. That, that's, a, that's a common principle. But what the, uh, the Chiddush, the innovation of this particular piece is, I was saying, turning a descent into an ascent, turning, turning some kind of lack or otherwise negative challenging experience into a growth experience, that is the illumination of Mordechai. That, that is the Ha'ara Shel Mordechai that we saw mentioned above in the Yarizel's Torah brought down by Rav Chaim Vital. So something about Mordechai is all about turning, turning the bad into the good, turning it on its head. And we're going to um, see how that plays out now in many different levels of the Purim experience and the Purim story. So first of all, this, the next uh, source, Esther 9.1, the top source on the next page, is um, a great classic source that is often quoted to epitomize the Purim story. I'll, I'll read it in English, but then I, and I'll come back to some of the Hebrew. And in the 12th month, which is the 12th, which is, sorry, and in the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, on the, 13th, or the, on the 13th day thereof, when the king's order and their edict drew near to be put into execution, on the, on the day that the Jews' enemies looked forward to ruling over them, it was turned on its head. The Jews should rule over their enemies. And that, that phrase, it was turned on its head, is v'nafochu. V'nafochu is something that has become a mantra at this time of year for many people, something a lot of people meditate on. A lot of people use it as the toast if they're drinking on Purim and that folklore. And it really does epitomize a lot of the story and the energy of Purim. That there's a very sudden and unexpected reversal. And this is something that um, can make the Purim story seem somewhat fantastical. We might look at the Purim story and think, well, you know, it's obviously kind of farcical and uh, like a parody in many ways, which it is. And we might not take it so seriously for that reason. We, we might think, you know, it's a kid's story. It's a pantomime. And, you know, it is actually great as a kid's story also, you know, without the violence, obviously. Um, but it's also a really serious insight there into the way things actually can work in the real world sometimes. We might not always let ourselves admit it, but things can turn on their head and change very quickly and suddenly and unexpectedly. And, Normally, when I think about this, the example that comes to mind for me most strongly is the Arab Spring. I was just going on about my life. I'm a news junkie, especially news related to the Middle East. I was just going on about my life. And it was known that there were a number of countries in the Middle East that were not super stable and super democratic. And that one day something might happen that, that changed some of them along, along the line so at some point. But it was a very vague expectation. There was no prognosis of any experts expecting what happened to happen and what happened as we all know is several of them were over, overthrown overturned in rapid succession in very very dramatic turn of events that's still affecting us now and, and that's the real world and, it, and and you know the uh the turning on its head that's mentioned in esther doesn't seem so fantastical and, and, and like a kid's story i think we're in the context of those events so that's the uh, the political piece, which is an is an important piece of the Esther story too. But we're we're going to keep focusing more on the spiritual. But I wanted to kind of 
you know, point out that it's not just a, a fantasy. So this next piece from Seyfi Yitzira, we saw on one of our previous source sheets, for those of you who, who are with us then, but this is the, the passage from Seyfi Yitzira, which describes the energy of our month. Every letter, every month has a letter and a constellation and a part of the body associated with it in this passage. So Adar, it says, he made the letter Kuf king over laughter and he bound a crown to it and he combined one with another and with them he formed Pisces in the universe, Adar in the ear and the spleen in the soul, male and female. So this is describing the creator giving Adar its special qualities, being associated with Pisces, being associated with the spleen. And for us, the thing we really want to focus in on is this issue of laughter, in Hebrew, schok. And we're going to look at laughter and its related cousin, Joy, in detail and why it will be something that we would have to work on, not just take for granted, and what we can do about it, what we can do with it at this time specifically, and how that relates to Purim and everything else going on in this time. There's one more piece here in this section, which also adds a beautiful piece of context, ties things together. This is from the pre sadik a source we've also seen a little bit together before, which is Rav Sadok Cohen of Lublin, who uh, he was the uh, great Hasidic master who was actually born into a family opposed to Hasidic tradition and did himself uh, a flip in his life, which really informed a lot of his teachings. So he says, in Nisan too, also in Nisan, which you know, we're getting to after this month, there were supernatural miracles, great miracles. But the decree of persecution was not inverted to salvation. But in Adar, the decree itself was inverted to salvation and darkness to light. And this is the teaching of the letter Kuf. So I was very surprised by this when I first saw it, because I thought, well, actually, you know, Nisan is a dramatic salvation. You could say, you know, the, the Jews in Egypt were being persecuted terribly. And specifically, you could point out that, you know, the baby boys were condemned to be drowned. And then we were very dramatically saved, including the Spilly in the Red Sea, as we all know, which included the Egyptians being drowned. But he says, nonetheless, that, w- that wasn't the very decree itself, the thing that was persecuting them, being flipped 180. It, was, it wasn't that. It was some, something else happened which changed the story. But in Adar, he says, we're talking about exactly the thing which is causing the problem being turned on its head. And that's, that's the issue, he said. That's the, the unique thing about Adar. Actually, it makes me think also of the theme of Purim, of dressing up and carnival and festival, where things are not what they seem, things are, are their opposite. So, and he ties that in with the letter Kuf. He says, the letter Kuf comes to teach us that. Now, I, this is something I saw talked about in a lot of sources. I didn't bring it here just to save space, but I'll, I'll give you guys a little bit of the background. First of all, Kuf is the only letter of the alphabet where in its, in its usual form, without being a final letter, its line goes down lower than all the other letters. It goes down below the regular line. So, it, its shape to the Kabbalists, they look closely at the shape of all the letters and derive teachings from them. Its shape suggests a relationship with that which is below. And it says in the Zohar and a few other places too, that Kuf is the letter which rules over Gehenna, which is the Jewish equivalent of hell. It's not really fair to call it hell exactly, but it's the closest thing we have. It's a place of negativity, kind of purgatory, definitely associated with the forces of evil. And Kuf is the letter that rules over them. But it also says in Zohar and a few other places that Kuf can also be redeemed. It can be used also to do tremendous good. And in that way, it really epitomizes this energy of Nafokhu, that it can be the, the letter of hell, but also it can be the letter of, of tremendous goodness. Excuse me. So um, that's, uh, that's what he's, uh, that's kind of the background of what Rav Sadok there is, is referring to. I'm gonna, um, every now and then I just look at the chat to see if there's any questions or comments. So feel, feel free to jump in if you have any, any thoughts or questions about any of this. Otherwise, I'm gonna continue to section one. 
joy, laughter, and overcoming evil. So we saw above, we saw the Sefer Yitzhara mention Schok being key to the energy of this month. And we talked a lot about the inversion piece. And we're going to focus in on laughter and joy and see what we can learn from them and about them that's relevant. So this is a famous verse, Esther 816, from the Megillah that again is often quoted and sung. There are many beautiful tunes to this verse. It's just taken by a lot of people to epitomize some of the energy. And actually, it's one of the most uh, often quoted verses because we also say it every week in the Habdallah ceremony at the end of Shabbat. The Jews enjoyed light and joy, happiness and honor. And we have, uh, we have quite a few different words for joy in our tradition. Here we see simcha and sason already as two of the, uh, the more common ones, but there are quite a lot of other ones too. And I think it's a very worthwhile question for us to explore the relationship between simcha and schok, especially. And that's what we're, we're going to uh, focus in on a little bit. This is a uh, Rav Sadok again in pre Sadik, the same piece just quoted above. He says, to me, he says, it seems laughter and joy are the same thing. They're one matter, except, except one difference. Joy is in the heart. Laughter is the revelation of the joy that is in the heart. So that he doesn't see any, any, uh, re- any real difference between them except expression. And the, this, uh, this interesting idea that simcha, joy itself, is more internal, is not necessarily ex- expressed, but that sechok is the, is the expressing of it. I don't think, having seen a lot of other sources in the tradition that deal with this issue, that that statement quite does justice to the complexity of the issue, but I think it's nonetheless helpful to, uh, to bear in mind. We're gonna see a few other uh, perspectives on laughter and joy. So this next piece from the Talmud is uh, it's taking us way back to the, the classic rabbinical tradition. The Talmud is canonized around the 5th century. So it's taking us back to an earlier strata of Jewish literature, which has more authority. That's the way the tradition works. And here we we'll see a, a, different, a very different opinion, I think, to that which uh, Rav Sadok brings. So it says, the divine presence, the Shekhinah, rests upon an individual neither from an atmosphere of sadness, nor from an atmosphere of laziness, nor from an atmosphere of laughter, nor from an atmosphere of frivolity, nor from an atmosphere of idle conversation, nor from an atmosphere of idle chatter, but rather from an atmosphere imbued with the joy of mitzvah. Mitzvah, again, commandment or connection. So it's actually more beautiful in the Hebrew, I think. In Shekhinah Shorah, Lo Metoch Atzvur, so, so we have there a whole list of things that the Divine Presence doesn't want to go near, that block us from being close to the Divine Presence, the Shekhinah. And Sechok is one of them. It's really interesting. Sechok, laughter, I think in this context, when, you, when it's in a list with things like sadness and laziness and frivolity and idle conversation, idle chatter. I think I have to say this laughter is not an especially positive laughter. This is a laughter of maybe superficial things or maybe even a, a kind of mocking laughter, that is, I mean, a kind of cynical laughter, but it, whatever it is, it's, uh, it's clearly not overtly and plainly positive. But on the other hand, the last line, Simcha shel mitzvah, the joy that we get of, of, through connecting to the divine, through doing a commandment, that is uh, how we become worthy of the divine presence dwelling with us, according to this passage from the Talmud. So I, I see there a very, very clear distinction between uh, what sechok can be in, in its negative manifestation and simcha. So again, so we're going we're gonna to see a few more pieces. It's, uh, it's complex because obviously sechok, laughter can occur in lots of different ways. We all know from our own experience, people laugh for lots of different reasons with lots of different emotions going on. So again, that one formulation is not going to be you know, the end of the conversation, but we're, we're going to see it's an important piece, which will be referred back to. 
Okay, so let's look at the, uh, the Maharal next piece. In the next two pieces, he's commenting directly on our question, and he's trying to uh, address what is Simcha really, and especially on this question of um, its, its uh, contrast to these other qualities, including Schok. And he, he's trying to explain to us what's special about it, and, and especially to go into a bit more detail about what it, what it feels like as an inner experience. The Maharal, great 16th century sage, as you see from what I wrote there, is often thought of as a grandfather of the Hasidic tradition. He was a kind of proto Hasid. He, he, uh, he, says, he says a lot of things from the mystical tradition in very plain and psychologically insightful language that really uh, predated the Hasidim by just a century or so, but did something pretty similar to what he did. So in this, in this first piece, he says, the Tanaitic teaching from the, from the Talmud says that a person should not stand to pray the Amidah, the standing prayer, except with the joy of connection, the Simcha Shel Mitzvah. For through joy, which is spiritual wholesomeness, the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, rests on them, and the person will be, will be with the Blessed Divine. So the, uh, the, the phrase I want to focus in here on is his description of, of what joy is in this context, which is shahi shleimut hanefesh. Simcha is shleimut hanefesh. I, I translated it there as spiritual wholesomeness. You could also translate it as completion of the soul. So, so some, some, uh, some element of completion or wholesomeness on a spiritual level, that's joy according to the Maharal here. And in the next piece, he's going to give us a little bit more insight into what that feels like, into what the experience of this Simcha is. He says here in the Be'er every thought hinders joy by preventing us from entering fully into activity. For thought works against joy. So the context of that piece is actually a piece about dancing, about the Avodah, the spiritual work of our month, that the, our practice. And he, he's saying, when you want to be doing something like dancing, you want to be doing a, ser- a service, an, an act of spiritual practice, you've got to just do it. In that situation, thought is going gonna, is gonna to hold you back. But he says it in this very strong general language. I wonder if he's really trying to make a general point. And if he is, it's, it's very strong because you, you might think, well, sometimes I have happy thoughts, right? Sometimes... I have thoughts which don't hinder my joy. Some, sometimes, you know, there I'm thinking about wonderful things and, it, and it's helping me be more joyful. But I wonder if he's hinting that even so, even though it's possible to have happy thoughts, of course, that there's a kind of joy which is actually beyond thought, which even when we're having happy thoughts, we're not in the... the exact state of simcha that he's trying to point towards for us. And I believe from, from the context that is a fair reading, because I think he says it stronger than necessary. And he's, he's very uh, careful with his language and you know, not, not someone who, you know, who says things in one place and then kind of takes them back somewhere else. So, so I, I believe it's fair to, uh, to take his words at face value as a statement saying, happy thoughts are good, Okay, it's possible, but there's actually a kind of joy beyond thought. And we, we need to, we need to uh, you know, bear that in mind. <laughs> Think about it, maybe even act on that. So we get in the Hasidic tradition and the next source from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, we mentioned before, we get uh, an explicit dealing with a lot of the issues to do with joy um, because it was very central to Rabbi Nachman's life. He lived a very... Uh, a very difficult life in a lot of ways, a short life, and also a life which he struggled a lot with issues of joy and a lack of joy. In the uh, Arthur Green biography, Arthur Green says that he seems to be a manic depressive. I don't know because I wasn't there, but you know, it's it's a, it's definitely a, one very strong reading of who Rabbi Nachman was. Definitely very possible to read his life story and his teachings in that way, whether he was or not. He left us a tremendous treasury of wisdom on this issue, which we can benefit from immensely. So he says, in this, uh, this important teaching to do with joy, he says, 
it's a great mitzvah to always be joyful. This is something we hear, we hear sung a lot. Mitzvah gedola liyot b'simcha tamid. And to overcome the distance, and sorry, and to overcome and distance oneself from sadness and bitter depression with all of one's strength. All of the sicknesses which come to a person come only because of a lack of joy. So very, very strong statements. He talks a lot in many places about this atzvut, bahamara, shokhara, this sadness and really this, this bitter blackness, you could, you could uh, translate that as mara shokhara. He talks a lot in many places about that and, and how overcoming it is a, uh, is a, is a, partly a question of sheer determination and effort. Just notice the, uh, the comment on the chat. Thank you, Karen. I'm gonna, I'll pause after this source maybe and do that and put everything in context and provide a kind of overarching framework. Thank you for the, the hint to do that. So Rabbi Nachman is, um, he's saying, first of all, that there's a, there's a matter of shit determination effort. And then he makes this very strong statement that our health, the sicknesses which come to us are related to a lack of joy. And of course, if we took that completely literally, I think we might be missing some, uh, some wisdom that medical science has to teach us. But I also, I also think from my own experience and my, you know, my own limited knowledge of well, what I've experienced in my own life and those around me, that it is true that joy is part of our toolkit of resilience that helps us be more healthy in every way. I, I imagine you've also experienced some element of that in your life. I've seen it uh, quite often in a lot of people. And so let's continue reading the source and then we'll, we'll uh, come back to Karen's question. For it is human nature to draw oneself to bitter depression and sadness because of sometimes challenging events. You can hear in that, in that statement, I think, how difficult his own life was in this way. That you know, he, he's, he's willing to make a blanket statement about human nature maybe partly based on his own experience. And every person is filled with suffering. Therefore, one must compel oneself with great strength to always be joyful and to make oneself joyful and to make oneself joyful and to make oneself joyful even with foolishness. Mile de Stutta is not a, uh, a positive phrase normally. You know, it's like stupidity, foolishness. Like, you know, why would you waste your time with that? But he's saying... If it's a question of cheering yourself up and getting yourself out of that place of sadness and black depression, do whatever it takes. And this next paragraph is very, very important. I think this next paragraph shows us he's not talking about avoiding reality. He's not talking about suppressing things. Listen to this. He says, although a broken heart is very good, this applies only to a specified time. And it is appropriate to fix the time every day to break one's heart to express oneself before the blessed divine. He's saying, don't run away from what's really inside you. Deal with it, process it, whether it's you know, meditation or prayer or therapy, you know, the kind of spiritual work that he advises his followers to do is to basically use God as your therapist. It's called Hibodido. It just means talking in your own words to God. And he advises his followers to do it for an hour every day. Pour out your heart before God. Break your heart before God for an hour every day. He says, when you're not doing that, when it's not that specified time to doing it, you, it's not okay to wallow in that sadness. You have to make a strong effort to pull yourself out of it. Very, very strong. So let me, let me pause there and um, give a kind of overview of the, of the, uh, of the shape of the, of the class. And I apologize if this was uh, something I should have done in the beginning and I was too eager to jump in so we the uh, the shape is we start by um we started by exploring the fact that there is a special illumination and opportunity of this time as a, every time and started exploring that it's connected to the idea of things being turned on their head and in the safety of Syria in our oldest kabbalistic text it's connected to laughter and then in the story of esther itself we saw in that verse 816 there's a connection to joy and, then, and we started exploring the relationship between laughter and joy and how, how we can understand them and actually experience them and what we have to learn from them. And now in the Hasidic tradition, especially with Rabbi Nachman, 
we're, we're already finding, we're going to see a few more sources along these lines, that joy is a very powerful teacher. That jo joy is not something to be taken lightly, as it were, even though, of course, lightness is part of it. And it's a very, it's a very uh, important subject for getting to know ourselves better and for improving our design, divine service. And that, that will take us to uh, the next uh, section, the, ne the next subject, which is um, a very uh, interesting part of the work of this month, which is letting go of what we think we know. We have to, I think we have to go through joy first to, uh, to fully understand it, but we'll get there. So uh, I hope that please uh, follow up with any questions or comments. If, if people want more explanation, that would, that would be absolutely fine. Okay. So uh, in the next piece in Lukute Maran 210, Rabbi Nachman gives us the most specific advice we've seen so far, I think, for how they can access joy. I think so far we've seen him say that, you know, joy is, very necessary to, to strive for, but we have, and also that this great idea about feeling our brokenness and pouring out our heart before God, that's great. But we have, I don't think we've seen yet him say how, how directly we can access joy. And this piece, he starts off by saying that. He says, the main reason why most people are far from the blessed divine is because their minds are not settled and they do not settle themselves. Yeah, that's something uh, in our day and age even more than his who probably uh, recognize as being pretty familiar to our situation just the fact that it's, it's pretty hard to attain a calm mind without very deliberate practice in our day and age and uh, I'll skip forward just a little bit for the sake of time and then and, uh, we see in the so I'm skipping the next short paragraph and starting again when someone is depressed it is impossible to direct their thoughts according to their will Therefore, it's hard for them to settle their mind. Only with joy can they direct their minds, their thoughts, sorry, that's a typo, can they direct their thoughts wherever they want and settle their mind. So he's making here a very clear and direct connection between a settled mind, Yeshuv Hadad, and joy. He's saying, of course, when you're struggling with that black depression, which he, I think, did know something about, it's impossible to have a settled mind because you know your thoughts are going in all kinds of challenging negative places and it's very hard to control them but if if we can access joy there's a relationship there to a calm mind and i think you're saying vice versa also that this is a way we can we can uh, access joy is through trying to settle our mind i think that thing that the relationship goes two ways and then he get, and he says something very beautiful he says ki simcha hu olam hachirut for joy is a universe of freedom. And what's a beautiful verse from Isaiah, for you shall go out with joy, meaning that through joy, we become free and leave our exile. So joy is freedom from our own depression, from our own slavery, from our own struggles. When a person attaches joy to their consciousness, their consciousness and thoughts become free and they are no longer in exile. And then he gives, again, very good and quite specific advice, which he fleshes out somewhere else. But I'll provide some context now. Very specific advice for a technique we can use to do this in our own lives. And it's, it's a teaching he's very famous for. And it's, a person comes to joy by finding some good point within themselves, no matter what it is. And this, is, this has become a real trademark teaching of his. There's a whole uh, long teaching called the uh, Zamra Torah, which goes into this matter at great length. The heart of the, of the matter is that we all have a voice in our heads. We all have a voice in our head which says we never did anything good. That even when we try and find something good about ourselves, we are, we're going to find that, oh, we did things for the wrong reason. And our motivation was no good. We didn't do it that well anyway, et cetera, et cetera. We all have, you can call it the inner critic or the inner something even worse, whatever you want to call it. We all have it. And he says, you know what? Despite that, despite the fact that voice is there, and despite the fact it might even be partly true that we don't always do everything perfectly and for the perfect motivation, despite that, there's an tova, a good point, a good place inside every single person. And if just acknowledging that and accessing it and having a relationship with that part of ourselves 
changes who we are. And he also says something very beautiful. He says, we also have to do that work for other people. We also have to look at other people. And even though they might be, he says, even if they are a completely wicked person, he says, we have to look at them and try and see the good point within them, which can be very, very hard sometimes, especially if that person is currently engaged in some kind of conflict with us. He says, we have to do it. And he says something very beautiful. He says, when we do that work, it changes them. It changes who they are, it, which is not what you might expect. You might expect him to say, doing that work changes us, which I believe it does too. But he's saying not only that, it changes the person to exist in a universe where they can be seen for their better potential. So th this work is something he devotes a lot of time and energy to teaching and a very important point of uh, Bresla Chassidu. We'll move on uh, for the sake of time. I hope that's a technique that we can uh, we can carry in our own lives. So the next piece brings us back to dancing, our spiritual practice of the month. And uh, it's, a it's a beautiful allegory he brings. And uh, I'll read it outside. It's, it's quite long for the sake of time. It says, there's a circle of people dancing and there's someone depressed on the outside and the dancers are happy, they're having a great time. They see the person who's depressed and miserable outside the circle and they drag that person into the circle and they force that person to be joyful. And I think, you know, we can relate from our own experience to, to some extent, we've all been roped into things which, you know, maybe we didn't want to do. And sometimes it works out. And as we know, sometimes it doesn't. In Rabbi Nachman's allegory, it works out. And in this story, the way he tells it, the person who was roped into the circle to dance, it worked. It, they got carried away in the joy too. They were forced into it and, and it did them good. So he says, that's what's going on inside us as well. We have places in us, we have things going on inside ourselves, which are not easy. We have depression, we have blackness, we have suffering. We have to drag it into the joyful places in us. And then he says, we have to pursue them, skipping down to... Uh, the bottom line of the main paragraph, one must precisely pursue those very things, he says. Davka. Like we have to, we have to, those, those things which are most painful to us, we have to pay attention to them. We have to go into them with the intention, not again, not of wallowing in them, but of bringing them into joy. Bring them into the dance. Bring them into the circle of joy. And he here also at the bottom of this piece makes a move which is very interesting, I believe. He, he directly equates sadness and grief and depression to evil in the, in the Kabbalistic cosmology, the other side, as it's known, the Sitra Akhra, which you know, represents everything bad throughout the Jewish tradition. Is, he, he says depression, that, that sadness in us, that, that inability or refusal, that inhibition to be joyful is evil. And that's why he says we have to be so determined in fighting it. It's an enemy to fight we have to, how do we fight it? We drag it into that joyful place. We see here in the next source, another statement of his about dancing, which is, uh, I think, very, uh, very powerful about what, what he thinks dancing can do as a manifestation of this joy. He says, God forbid there are heavenly judgments against Israel. Dancing and hand clapping can ameliorate those judgments. Literally, it, it's a ham takata dinin is sweetening the judgments. Meaning, if, the, if something bad is going to happen, this can change the course of events just by people dancing and hand clapping. And you know, as a metaphysical teaching, there's there's no reason to uh, to be selling that. You know, people can take it or leave it. But as a psychological teaching, that if people are suffering sometimes. Being more joyful can sometimes truly help them see things more clearly and make their situation better, improve their reality, or at least improve the way they receive their reality, the way they deal with their reality. And that I think, um, you know, there's a level of, of truth to teaching even on that level. And then he says, dancing and hand clapping are drawn from the spirit of the heart, as can be seen, for it is through the joy in their heart that a person dances and claps their hands. So he's saying, just look at someone who's having a good time dancing. And it's clear, it's not just a physical act. Dancing is not just moving the body. It's obviously engaging the ruach, shebalev, the spirit of the heart. 
So it's it's not um it's not something we shouldn't confuse it for for a purely physical act. And again, that's why it's a spiritual avoda, a spiritual practice that we we uh, deserve to give ourselves time and space to really uh, let our bodies do what they want to do. Now, also bearing in mind what we saw already, remember we saw from the Maharal that piece saying that thought inhibits simcha. Thought, thought, thought holds back joy. And we also saw with Rabbi Nachman that being far from God and being far from joy was related to having a lot of thoughts in our head, to our mind being unsettled. So bear in mind those two pieces now as we're going to go forward and see a related spiritual practice of our month, which is letting go of what we think we know, literally not knowing. You can see it manifest in a lot of ways. First of all, in the, in the Talmud, in the tractate devoted to Purim, Megillah, it says, Rava, great sage, taught that a person is obligated to become intoxicated on Purim until they do not know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. Haman, a very evil person. Mordechai, a very good person. Purim, this is, this is something that people take very seriously, this obligation of Purim, to, to let go of sobriety, to let go of, of all your judgments, of what you think you know, and, to get, and get to a place where you can press reset on a lot of your judgments. And it fits beautifully with the Purim story on a lot of levels. This next piece from the Talmud is one way, is uh, one good example of that. It, uh, it quotes the Megillah where it says, and Mamuchan said, Mamuchan is an advisor of the king mentioned very briefly at the beginning of the story. And the, the sages say, it was taught in Talmud, Mamuchan is actually Haman. And he was called Mamuchan, which means prepared, because he was prepared for his own calamity. So if you look at the Purim story, you'll see Haman has everything lined up, all his ducks are in a row. He's constantly planning and plotting. He's constantly making sure that everything is just right. And that's why the rabbis say he deserves this nickname of Mr. Preparation. But they say all of its preparation only came back on his own head. And again, that's a great example of this nafohu, this principle of Purim of surprising reversal and inversion that he, he really is the victim of. So the, uh, the element that connects to not knowing, I wanted to highlight for us right now, is he thought he knew what would result from all his careful planning. And in fact, the exact opposite did. Bear that in mind for the next piece, says that when Haman was drawing lots to decide when to kill all the Jews in the story, he, he drew a lot that said the month of Adar. And he said, amazing. Everybody knows that that's the month that Moses died in. But he did, and then it says, and he did not know that on the seventh of Adar, Moses died. And on the seventh of Adar, he was born. There's a lot going on here. First of all, how come he knew the day that Moses died, but didn't know the day he was born? Also, why did he really care about Moses? Like Moses lived 800 years before Purim. So one possible way of answering both those questions is he understood Moses provided, well, let's start from the basics. It was Moses who brought the Jewish people the Torah. And through that, Moses provided the Jewish people with a very central part of who they were and their, especially their connection to the divine. And that Moses' death represented a weakening of, of the force, of the life force of the Jewish people. Now, as for the second question, he, he opened himself to the knowledge of when Moses died, because that was what interested him. He, he, want, he was, you know, we, we've all been in a situation of like wanting to know about something and reading up on it with great curiosity. He didn't want to know when Moses was born. He didn't check that part of the Wikipedia page. He just, it just he had no attraction to it. And because of that, he let himself make a decision, a very important decision, based on half of the picture. And this is actually something that we all do all the time in life. I just saw there's a comment on the chat. I'll come back to it in a sec if that's okay. Um, so after I finish the sentence, that we, we, throughout all of our lives, are often in a situation where we have some information to make a decision, and we do the best we can to make a decision given that. 
but there might be another piece of information, which is the other, the other side of the story, the other side of the coin, which completely changes the decision we would make. And I think the core of this teaching is we should always remember that possibility of there being a, a piece of information that completely changes the picture. Let me come back to the chat now. Could you also say that Muhammad was unconsciously prepared for his own demise? Because we're getting to the place where there is no difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. Lisa, I'm going to ask you to unmute your microphone and please say a little bit more about that because I don't quite get it, but it sounds interesting. Yeah, so can you hear me right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I kind of like this idea that like, you know, we look at Muluchan and he's completely prepared and we give him that name. Um, and we're trying to get to that place of like, you know, understanding that there's no difference between like, you know, good and evil or sort of like blessed and cursed. And so like maybe as evil as Mamukhan was, like unconsciously the good within him was preparing for his own demise. And it was sort of like perfect in its own way in a, you know, sort of, I, I think it's sort of like a conscious unconscious thing, but like if we're sort of putting every one person into its own universe, like that's his own internal balance. Beautiful. I really like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. I have nothing to add to that except thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to go away and think about that because I haven't quite thought of it quite in that way, but I'll um, definitely think about that, especially when I'm, Hearing the Megillah. That's a, that's a really interesting reading. Thank you so much. Awesome. So we, we've seen a few, course, a few sources from the Talmud about not knowing, about thinking we know and actually ending up realizing we don't know so much. And now we're going to see the Hasidic rabbis, 1,200 years later, after the Talmud was closed, come and they take that idea of the limits of our knowledge and the wisdom of not knowing and they make it much more explicit and in a very radical way. So we're going to see, first of all, from the Baal Shem Tov, from one of his first most important students, the Todot Yaakov Yosef, who really uh, is one of our most important sources of the Baal Shem Tov's Torah. He actually published the first book of Hasidic Torah, of his Rebbe's Torah. And uh, he, he brings this beautiful teaching here in Pasha Balat. It says, the wise man should not praise himself for his wisdom, quoting Jeremiah. This means that he should be satisfied with the wisdom he has already learned. He needs no more, only to be wise and know me. For certainly, the more wisdom a person has, the more they know how they don't know. For the goal of knowledge is not knowing. I had a lot of fun translating that passage. It was, it was it's a lot of ins and outs. I did the best I could, and actually I'd be open to, uh, to any suggestions people have for changes if you do. But I, I think I managed to do justice to the main gist of it. There is a limit to how much you're going to learn, just learning more, learning more, learning more. I think we've all been, you know, relate from if you've ever studied anything to the idea that, you know, there's no end, there's no limit to information. There's no limit to how many hours you can study something. But he says that's not real wisdom. Real wisdom is knowing the limits of your knowledge, knowing what you don't know. We're going to see this now applied in the next source, in the Mo'o'e Naim, in a way that we might think is surprising when we consider how the rabbis like to spend their time. He says, after a person learns all of the Torah, and he doesn't just mean the five books of Moses, he means all of the Torah. He means all those tens of thousands of books. After a person learns all the Torah, then they know and understand that they do not know anything. For the goal of knowledge is not knowing. I, I love that statement so much because this is a person like all the others in the tradition who devoted every waking second to studying and teaching Torah. It was the most important thing possible to him. He says it's not, it was ne the aim, the goal is never like to know information, to be knowledgeable. He says, the more you know, the more you don't know. And now we see this, uh, the next source I think really brings a lot of what we've been studying in this class together very beautifully. The not knowing and the spiritual work of this season. We're gonna, we're gonna see how it, uh, how it all comes together very beautifully. 
the uh, the Ohev Yisrael is the great great grandfather of Avraham Yoshua Heschel, the famous Heschel of the late 20th century, who he the 20th century Heschel was named after. He was a very great Hasidic teacher in his own right. So he says. In our day, he's talking about Purim for us today. He says, Esther has already destroyed Haman's strength. He said, he's saying that the story about Haman that we read in Megillah Esther, that's finished. Like that, that one is, is gone. That particular bogeyman is, is not a problem for us anymore. However, it is still up to us to break the strength and power of the wicked Haman who came from the seed of Amalek, which dwells in the heart of each and every Jew as individuals, and as a community. So he's saying that particular Haman, as a person, that, that guy is long gone, but there is still an element of that energy within our heart. And actually this ties in beautifully, I think, Lisa, to what you were saying about Haman's uh, internal life and the different parts uh, of him and what's going on inside him, that we can understand Amalek, this, this evil seed that he comes from, and that negative energy of Haman and Amalek, we can actually understand it as part of ourselves. Each of us, the people of God, must uproot the wickedness hidden within. For this reason, oh, actually, let me pause there and say, you know, we might read this so far and think <sighs> that we're, we're dealing with kind of conventional morality, uh, you know, which basically says, you know, every person has like something bad inside them and, the, you know, we need to be, do, do ascetic practice and suppress it in some way. And, you know, that, that's a thread we see within all religions and there are threads of that within Judaism, but that's not the way that we go with the Hasidic tradition generally. We're going to see a very different tack being taken here. He says, for this reason, we too must go higher than the conscious mind in order to completely destroy this element of wickedness. You're saying you want to destroy that element of Haman and Amalek inside you? Got to get above your conscious thoughts. Our blessed sages alluded to this with their sweet words when they said, a person is obligated to become intoxicated on Purim until they do not know the difference between blessed is Mordechai and cursed is Haman. When a person leaves and goes above the conscious mind, they will not know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. There, everything is the same as its opposite. And a person can destroy that wickedness, a person can destroy that wickedness that dwells within them. So we, we've, we, I'm now going to kind of uh, do a quick um, run through and summary of everything we've seen and explain how I think that really ties things together beautifully. So we saw this idea that there was a radical turning of things on its head. The illumination of Mordechai was understood as a, a, things could change in surprising and radical ways. And that's central to the energy of Purim and Adar. And we saw, the, we saw the connection also of our month to Simcha and to, to laughter and the interesting relationship between laughter and joy that's seen differently throughout the centuries and different sources. We saw Rabbi Nachman's very insightful comments about how joy, it can be related to a settled mind and, and how depression and the blackness that he, of sadness that he describes can be related to struggling to get our thoughts calm. We all saw also the connection to dancing when the Maharal's comment that dancing is something we just have to do and not let the thoughts block it. We, just, we have to get to a place beyond those conscious thoughts holding it back. And then we got into our, our subject of not knowing, how central to the work of Purim is not to think we know everything and actually to try as much as possible and let go of what we think we know. We saw this taught in many different ways in, in Talmud and the Hasidic masters. And finally, we get here to the context of the, the spiritual struggle against Amalek, which is a key theme of Purim, in both the original story and in the spiritual interpretations in the mystical tradition. And the Ohev Yisrael is saying here, how do you eradicate wickedness from your heart? You might think it's through, through some kind of you know, self flagellation or ascetic practice or denying yourself or suppressing something and repressing something. Somebody says the way to do it is get beyond those conscious thoughts, get to a place where you're in a different state of mind. And I believe the, the two suggestions from the teachings we've seen how to do that are 
one to, to deliberately settle the mind and you know obviously a great way to do that be any kind of meditative practice and specifically the practice of our month of, of dancing of mindful movement as a practice which will help us get into a state of flow and of just doing and a place where our conscious thoughts are not what is dominant and we we break our association that we often have between our conscious thoughts and our identity we often think whatever's going on in my mind that defines who i am but when we experience a state of flow our conscious thoughts are a little bit in the background then we know that there's actually more to us than that we are not only whatever happens to be going on in my mind right now so i'll pause again there and uh i'm happy to end here to respect people's time i'm also really happy if anyone has any more questions or comments i'm really happy to uh see if anyone does i share you tried to say something but i didn't hear you sorry not sure okay i just said thank oh thank you okay you're, very, thank you very much. you're so welcome you're so welcome lovely to learn with all of you Please, a few people have been emailing me questions about different things we've been discussing. Please keep doing that. And also, please feel free to use the WhatsApp group if you have a particular thing you'd like to share with everyone. Insights, questions, whatever you'd like to share. It would be lovely to uh, you know, to all, all benefit from each other's perspectives and questions. So we're about to go into Purim. So uh, Purim Sameach. Thank you, Karen. Happy Purim. And uh, you know, I hope things we've, uh, we've touched on will be useful and helpful for having a meaningful poem for everyone thank you thank you very much, much. Thanks, bye you're so welcome thank you bye thank you bye you're welcome bye bye